Welcome to Under the White Coat, where every week we spotlight a key opinion leader. These are doctors that are leaders in their specialty when it comes to research, education, or clinical practice. We're hoping that you learn a little about some key medical topics and about the person that's hiding underneath that white coat. I'm Dr. Sam Alfassi, uh, co-founder at Keops and a gastroenterologist in Toronto, Canada. Today, we're pleased to have Dr. Jeffrey Mosco, who's a therapeutic endoscopist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Canada. He might be recognizable from our GI colleagues as the co-director of the International Course of, on Therapeutics. Thank you again, Jeff, for joining us. All right, thanks, thanks for having me, Sam. Appreciate being here and uh, excited about your platform and a bit less so talking to you, but we'll uh, have a good time. Excellent. So Jeff, why don't you tell us, I know I gave a little bit away, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, as, as you said, uh, I'm a gastroenterologist at St. Mike's. Uh, I've been there for about uh, almost six years now. Um, I did, you know, I trained in Toronto. Um, I did my general GI training in Toronto. I did uh, my advanced endoscopy training in uh, Boston at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, came back to Toronto and joined the group at St. Mike's. Did a master's in quality improvement at patient and patient safety here at U of T. Um, and have been doing kind of all things endoscopy uh, uh, since then. And it's it's been quite the ride. Yeah, that's terrific. Uh, so I know uh, I could, I know maybe others uh, don't so much, but because uh, I send you a lot of uh, a lot of patients, so I know some of your areas of focus. But maybe tell yep. us a little bit about uh, some of your areas of focus in clinically. I'm, I'm a therapeutic endoscopist, and so I uh, I do ERCP endoscopic ultrasound um, and advanced resections, uh, and that includes you know the esophagus, Barrett's esophagus. Um, we have a huge Barrett's esophagus program, um, early gastric cancer and uh, gastric cancer resections. Uh, and we uh, are doing endoscopic submucosal dissection. Um, we do large duodenal polyps and ampulectomy um, and uh, big colon polyps as well as colorectal ESD. So again, really um, throughout the GI tract and, and pancreatic biliary endoscopy is uh, one of many focuses. No, it's terrific. I know a lot of the things you do, I might do sort of accidentally uh, when <laughs> removing these, uh, these massive polyps. It looks like you're, you know, you're dissecting half the colon. Um, that, and I know uh, you guys are very impressive. There's uh, fellows from around the world that come and uh, visit and train with you guys. Um, what, what research interests do you have or are you guys uh, involved with uh, at St. Mike's? Yeah, so, so we... Um... Uh, obviously, we're very heavy clinically, but we're also doing research. A couple of things uh, going on now is we are um, uh, starting a large uh, polyp adjudication process, which hopefully we're going to pilot and then roll out across the province, uh, where we uh, really are reviewing all uh, colon polyps uh, that are happening to make sure that polyps get to um, uh, the right person, be it surgery, if there's evidence of, uh, of submucosal invasive cancer, um, a, you know, tertiary center or uh, whether or not they should be done close to home. And so you'll be hearing about that uh, uh, shortly. And that's a pretty big undertaking uh, led by uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Tashima. Um, and so that's exciting. Also during COVID, uh, you know, things have been uh, obviously very different. And so uh, I've done a lot of work on endos endoscopic triage. Um, and we're looking at how uh, uh, virtual care uh, should be kind of done uh, during the pandemic and post pandemic. And so I'm the uh, co-PI to a large um, funded study at St. Mike's looking at virtual care amongst specialists and um, uh, just joined a multi-site uh, study uh, looking like evaluating virtual care for the Ministry of Health. So kind of looking, doing quality improvement work, both kind of locally and nationally in terms of uh, just delivering better care to patients. Yeah, that's terrific. I know uh, COVID has been sort of a, a very hot topic sort of in um, around medicine around the world. Uh, how, do, how, do, how have you found that COVID has impacted your practice and um, everything going forward as well? Yeah, so I, I mean, similar to you, it has totally changed what we do uh, and how we do it. Um, you know, for a while we were 
uh, really just doing emergency procedures only and everything had to be on hold um, at the height of the pandemic. And although we didn't get hit quite as hard as many people predicted, it's been a very, very slow process uh, ramping up our procedures. You know, the, um, the number of cases that we can do uh, just is not meeting the uh, demand. And so not only have many, many cases been canceled, but uh, the volume in our unit is is only around 50% as we uh, struggle with room turnover, uh, PPE available, um, and just, you know, getting back to the processes that kind of we had in place pre-COVID. So uh, we're, we're really struggling with that, which is why, you know, um, uh, we, you know, I've been part of a working group at the university just trying to figure out what the best way is to triage patients that have already been waiting a year versus more urgent ones that you get referred today. How do you pick and choose what cases need to be done? And so, you know, uh, our biggest concern, like everyone has, is, is you know, everyone talks about the second surge, but for us, it's the uh, second surge of non-COVID patients that have had their procedures delayed. And so that's uh, that's on my mind every day. And if you have a good solution to that, I'm I'm all ears. If kiosks can do that, then you've really landed on something. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely a challenge. I think the whole world is sort of feeling that. Everyone in medicine is sort of feeling that. Um, yeah. I want to get back actually to the uh, the polypectomy. I think you know the, that's something I always lean on your expertise uh, for, and I'm always astounded at the types of polyps you're able to remove. Um, so you know, I, I'm a general gastroenterologist. Uh, and there might be a lot of listeners out there that are, might be general gastroenterologists or even therapeutic endoscopists uh, who do a lot of large polyps. You know, what are maybe three uh, tips that you can give us about uh, removing large polyps? Yeah, um, so it's a good question. I have, uh, if you've ever heard me uh, give a talk, I give about 47 tips. And so, it, you know, and people usually go away with maybe one, one pearl, hopefully one <laughs> pearl. Um, I, I think you know, three things uh, that I like to focus on are number one, having a plan. So, you know, if when you're treating a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, you always have a plan, right? You know, you kind of have an algorithm about which drug you're going to use when and, and how to optimize those drugs. But sometimes gastroenterologists, when they see a polyp, just ask for any snare and they're not really thinking through a plan. So you need a plan about how you're going to best take out that polyp and um, and, you know, you really have one chance to cure these lesions and that's at the first sitting. So, you know, do you have the time necessary? Do you have the equipment necessary? Do you have the expertise uh, that you need uh, to get that polyp off? So always have a plan in place as to how you're going to tackle it um, and what you're going to do if things aren't going right. What if, you know, there's massive bleeding? What if the polyp's not coming off? What if you cause a perforation? Um, do you have everything kind of uh, set so you can kind of proceed down your algorithm. So number one, I would say is, is have a plan. Um, number two, I think is know your equipment. And so you, you just have to know um, how to use your electrosurgical unit and the principles of electrosurgery are using yellow pedal or blue pedal and which one is better and when. Um, you gotta know the characteristics of your snares and which is uh, stiffer, which is monofilament versus braided and how that affects your um, uh, end uh, effect on your tissue. Uh, so you have to learn your equipment and know when to use different things. And, you know, the, the more I do this, the more I find that I'm, that I'm really selecting my piece of equipment very carefully for different types of polyps in different areas. And so, um, and, you know, people say, well, at, at St. Mike's, you can just use whatever you want. And that's not really the case. Um, every unit can have more than one snare available. And so I think you got to know, um, uh, uh, what equipment is available to you. And then the last thing is uh, to just, you know, improve your ability to inject. And so I find that injection is extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, I've, I've slowly been moving from kind of hot snare EMR to cold snare EMR, uh, but the principles of injection stay the same. And so knowing how to inject and when to inject, uh, I think, are, are, and using injection to set yourself up for uh, success uh, hugely important. So number one, have a plan. Number two, know your equipment. Number three, when in doubt, inject, and uh, you'll be taken off uh, circumferential polyps in no time. 
No, that, that's great advice. I was actually going to ask you about uh, cold snare um, large polypectomy. Do you do much water immersion polypectomy? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I'm sort of mixing and matching techniques these days. Um, and so uh, I did a case last week where I used a combination of uh, hot snare, cold snare, and uh, underwater just for different areas of the polyp. And so this was a polyp that had was a recurrence uh, at the site of prior EMR, which I get lots of those sent to me and extremely fibrotic with a big scar. And so, uh, you know, I had to, I had to use, I started on the outside with, with uh, just your standard hot snare EMR. And as I got more to the middle, I used cold snare and then I had to go underwater just to uh, grasp some of the very fibrotic areas. So I think, um, it's not, I wouldn't say underwater is a mainstay, but I think, you know, when we're talking about the two centimeter polyp that, you know, just about all gastroenterologists and colonoscopists should be able to take out, I think cold snare EMR, it makes it really, really safe. And so if you, in, you inject and then use a, a dedicated cold snare to go through, the chance of complication, the chance of post EMR bleeding goes to all, to pretty much zero. And so I, I think that's where, you know, if we're talking about efficacy and safety, I think more and more people and the studies are going to show there's a randomized control trial coming down the pipeline are going to show that this is the way to go. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm happy to have, uh, you know, having you around uh, so then you can help us mortals uh, with some of those uh, difficult yeah, right. policies. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one way I wanted to end uh, uh, some of our uh, meeting our key opinion leaders is just asking sort of an interesting uh, question. So, uh, I just wanted to know, was there a time period or a year throughout your training, med school training or your career that was sort of stood out to you as something uh, special and sort of, and why? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of, um, as I'm sure you've had, there's lots of like um, checkpoints along the way that, that are memorable, um, but probably the mo my most memorable year of training would have to be my fellowship year, my advanced endoscopy training year. Um, number one, because we moved, uh, I dragged my family down south across the border uh, to Boston, which was obviously a beautiful city, but, but uh, I got to um, not only learn, you know, some advanced techniques with some of the best in North America, um, but, you know, I got to experience um, the healthcare system uh, across the border and realize sometimes how lucky we are at uh, what we have. And, and so I came back very appreciative, but, you know, I, I got to see kind of medicine and see endoscopy through a very different lens down there. Um, and I learned a crazy amount in my time there. So it was an unbelievable experience. That's terrific. Yeah. Jeff, you were awesome. Thank you so much for spending time with us uh, today. It was great getting to know you more and hopefully uh, some of our listeners and viewers will, uh, got to enjoy learning a little bit about polypectomy and about uh, Jeffrey Moscow. And uh, so uh, tune in every week. We're going to meet another key opinion leader, learn a few things, get to know them personally. Uh, thank you again. Awesome. My pleasure and good luck. Thanks again. Great. Thanks, Jeff.